was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive power and glory. sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and power and glory forever and ever. morning. Thank you all very much. Um, you all started our service off tremendously. It's a joyful thing to hear children sing. Isn't that true? It's amazing. Just a few things uh, to start our service to let you know about uh, some of the church family life things that are happening. Uh, Thanksgiving baskets are uh, being delivered this week. Thank you for those who have contributed or um, already been delivering them. If you would like to be involved in that, you can contact Pastor Bobby. Uh, we have a Turkey Trot 5K coming up on Thanksgiving morning. Uh, come on out, and uh, it'll be fun. 7 a.m. is the registration time. Children 12 and under are free. Lastly, we have a Christmas banquet in less than two weeks at 6 p.m. on December 1st. So keep that in mind, and uh, there are signups, of course, in the, the various foyers. Just wanted to... Uh, call to mind in this particular season something that really Christians should be doing in all seasons. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says this, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 
the Christian should have no problem being thankful. Do you agree? And just in case you have forgotten what Christ has done for you, let me read off a few titles of what Jesus Christ calls you as his children. You are chosen, holy, beloved, friends of God, brethren with Christ, children of God, and co-heirs with Christ. All of these things through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen? Let's pray this morning. Lord, we are thankful. Even in very difficult seasons of life, we are able to rejoice. Sometimes that rejoicing is with tears in our eyes. Because what we see is hard and difficult, but what we know to be true anchors our soul, that you are good and you are in full control. You will accomplish what you have begun in us. We have ample reason to be thankful. Lord, please cast out any ingratitude we have in our hearts. There is simply no room. And that we would count it a privilege and a joy to be here this morning singing your praises, hearing from your word, and most importantly, to be known and loved by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Help us to just rest and respond in that truth. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Would you stand? Let's lift our voices in praise to the Lord as we sing in Christ to the Lord, in Christ alone. Stop. 
Jesus commits my destiny.
choir out there this morning. It's beautiful. I have the privilege this morning of reading you the main text, which comes from the Psalm 95. It goes like this. O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods, in whom, whose hands are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as at Meribah, as in the day of Massa in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation, and said they are a people who err in their heart, and they do not know my ways. Therefore, I swore in my anger, truly, they shall not enter into my rest. You may be seated. We come to that time in our service of our tithes and offerings, and there are several ways you can do that. We pass the traditional plate. We have boxes on the walls near the entrances. And many of you give online, and we thank you all for being a contributor to this wonderful ministry here we call Riverbend Church. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just lift you up today and ask that you give us a very strong sense of your divine presence in this church. Fill our hearts, we pray, with all that you are and lead us in ways that we are always living, Father, in your will. We ask that you bless us in our direction as a church. And Father, point us toward how we can do more for you. As we worship now through the giving of our tithes, may we do so with grateful hearts 
for all that you do. Now, all that you have done for us through your son, Jesus Christ. Please bless Pastor Scott, Father, as he comes this morning to deliver the message. May we find great inspiration in serving you better. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. If you had children on the risers this morning and you're a parent, just a friendly reminder, they're waiting for you right now in the choir room. Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you here today. It did sound great. What a great choir there. Grateful for our worship teams, for our tech booth. If you're wondering where Hayward is, he's up there today. Um, thank you, Hayward. Um, I know you sacrificed so much for us. Thanks, Rick, and our team. Um, it's just a joy to see people who can lead us in worship. 
I'm so glad you're here. This is a Thanksgiving week. Um, I love this holiday. It is, it is my holiday. I, I like this one. Uh, and uh, so what a joy to hear you sing and just to worship with you. Just a couple reminders. Um, uh, quite a, This summer, actually, I asked uh, Sean Unthink. Uh, he teaches one of our BFGs to teach the Christmas banquet this year. If you've not heard him teach or been in his class, he is extremely interactive. He, he has a gift dialogue and teach through things and help you grasp things. Um, he's teaching the Christmas banquet this year. And if you have somebody who you want them to come away and know with clarity that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, he is God, he is your only hope, come to this Christmas banquet. Because they're going to come away going, I don't know if I believe that, but the Bible sure declares him to be who he says he is. And so I'm excited for that. If you have not got your tickets, go out there and get those. Uh, after we're done, come and be a part of that. Um, and then just before I get into our text today, I think Hayward's got a few pictures for me up there. Um, I was speaking with um, uh, our friends in Egypt this week. One of the things I don't think we always understand in the Middle East, some of the difficulty that goes on, certainly there's extreme hatred towards the Jews throughout many Arab nations. But when they cannot find Jews, they find Christians. And so we have a dear ministry um, that's out there. This is Pastor Gerges and his uh, wife. There's Samir and Gina and I on our last trip there about a year ago, about right now we were there. Um, and... Uh, it's, it's tense there. It's very tense in places like Egypt. Christians are being attacked. They're, they're very, very careful. Pastor Gurdjieff says they're, they're just working extra carefully as they live right in the world of the Muslims. And um, so we would ask that you pray for them. The next picture, um, this is uh, Pastor Gurgis and his elders there. These men love the Lord Jesus Christ. They live in a very different culture than you and I. But they love the Lord Jesus Christ and they preach the word of God there. These are our brothers and sisters and they too, their lives are threatened. So we do pray for them this week. Remember the church in the Middle East. There are churches all over the Middle East. Good, Bible teaching, solid churches. Many are underground. Many are not known. But they are there and they are suffering. And so would you remember to pray for them? I, mean, I know many pray for Israel, and we know that God will save a remnant from Israel. But we need to remember that church that's in the Middle East as well. Well, as we go to prayer, we will do just that together. Father, thank you for this time in the Word. We thank you for the gospel that is unhindered. It goes where you direct it. In fact, Lord, you said that it would go not only, and you charged your disciples not only just to Jerusalem, but not in Judea only, not in just Samaritan, but to the remotest parts of the world. In fact, the gospel has gone to violent places. It stands unmovable, unbending, because it's your word. And so we pray for those men and those women and those children who proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in places that have not the freedoms we do. And we ask, God, that you would protect them, strengthen them. May they be stalwarts. May they lean into the wind of difficulties with the truth that rescues souls. We thank you not only for Pastor Gerges and his family and that ministry there, but all of our missionaries around the world who are standing for you, Lord. We pray that you would bless them, meet their needs, give them favor, Lord. And Lord, wind the souls of the world through them, Lord, as they preach the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, here in America, we pray for the church in America. It's floundering, Lord. It's caught up in all kinds of issues. I pray, Lord, you would help us stand on the truth of the word of God. We would stand just like we pray for the missionaries overseas. Give us boldness, humility, that blend that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ gives us as we stand for the truth. Lord, we pray you would use Riverbend. God, let us not fall by the side. Lord, pick us up, use us. Use us in good times and difficult times. 
Help us to be those who will not compromise, but lovingly, humbly stand on your word. Lord, we thank you that we can cry out to you for help. Thank you that you know all of your children across the globe, those suffering and those uh, that have great prosperity even now. You know each one of them. You've given them everything they need. We pray, Lord, that we would trust you. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for the time in the word. Lord, I think of those who can't be here. Many traveling this week. Uh, some sick at home. Some have been through procedures and not back with the body of Christ yet. And so we pray for them, Lord. Lord, now here as we teach you, as we teach your word, may this glorify you and edify your saints. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll take your Bibles and turn to Psalms 95. That will be our text. I am itching to get back to finish that message on sufficiency of scriptures. I will get it. I promise it's, it's loaded and ready to go. Um, but I love Thanksgiving. <laughs> and I couldn't help but want to teach a passage and uh, uh, just some strong teaching on what creates Thanksgiving. I've entitled the sermon, The Path of Thanksgiving. The Path to Thanksgiving this morning. Well, Psalms 95 is one of those. We are not told in the psalm itself who the human author is. If you look at it, the beginning of it there, sometimes it'll say a psalm of David or As- uh, uh, of uh, Asap or someone like that. It'll tell us the psalm. But here it does not. But what's very interesting, and this is quite what should catch your attention here is when you go to Hebrews chapter 4 verse 7 here it's quoting this psalm and the writer of Hebrews says this he again fixed a certain day today saying through David after so long of a time just as has been said before you today if you hear his voice do not harden his heart and so the writer of Hebrews contributes this to David and, and so most likely that's the Lord I would, inspiring the writer of Hebrews to say that. And so we have a good understanding that most likely this is David. Now, the context in Hebrews 4 was, are you going to enter the rest of God or are you going to be under his judgment? And so we'll look at that passage as we go. In way of introduction, as I thought about this text and what it does, this great call to worship, it's one of these text that we say this is one of those call to worship texts. As I thought about it, I, um, I, I, I thought about art. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not all that big into art. My wife is much more into it. She has a great appreciation. In fact, I had to ask her about a lot of the pieces that I want to reference here. Um, there's two pieces of art that caught my attention. I am not a big person on paintings of Christ. Uh, I think you have to be careful with that a little bit. I'm, I'm just not that one. But there are two pictures that involve the Lord Jesus Christ that capture my attention greatly. The first one is by a man named James Tissot. He was a French painter, and he painted this painting, particular portrait, in the 1880s. What I love about this painting is it is the picture of Christ's view at the cross. You should look it up. James Tissot thought in his mind after studying the scriptures of what Christ would have seen hanging on the cross. There in the painting you'll see is Mary Magdalene and his mother and Jane, or excuse me, John there. You, send, you see a soldier on bended knee uh, repenting. You see angry soldiers there. You see Pharisees with their great uh, pride and arrogance. In the far distance you see more disciples and it's quite the painting and it, and it quite illustrates to you that, wow, this was the Lord's view. That's one of the paintings that I love of the Lord Jesus. There's another painting that is not as well known. It's by a Spanish artist, and I think I forgot his name, Vasquez, Velasquez, Diego Velasquez. It's said to be one of the paintings that is the most uh, uh, realistic of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you study this painting, it was done in, I think, somewhere around 1630s. The artist painted it so that the lower you get the more beautiful the picture is. In fact, when you go and visit this, it's said that those who bring you to it say, get down on your knees and look. In fact, if you want, lay on the floor and look up at it. That is the theme of this psalm. Come, worship, and bow down. When you do that, you will see the greatness of God. 
See, many don't bow down. Many don't bend the knee to God. They do not see him as God, maker, creator. And so the Bible teaches us over and over, the lower you go, the more glorious our Lord is. And this is what the psalmist is trying to do here. In fact, when you look at this psalm, as you heard Pastor Gary read it, there's this passionate call to the people of God to look up and praise him. Look up and praise him and enjoy the benefits of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a direct result of praise. This morning, if you're struggling with being thankful, I hope this passage teaches you to be a worshiper. Because you'll get your thanksgiving back when you become one who worships. The psalm carries a clear proclamation that the living God is sovereign above all other gods. Who are lowly and earthly made. They are made of of earthen materials. The psalmist extends this, as you look at this passionate fervor call to worship. And refers refers to God as this unique Not only just creator this, which brings the power to it, but he refers to him as a shepherd, which shows us the tenderness of him. Look up to your creator. Look up to your shepherd. See, it's only those whose hearts overflow from thanksgiving towards a living God who will respond respond to such a call of worship. In the end, all others are going to be warned. You'll see this in the passage. They're going to be warned of their unbelief. They're going to be warned of this apostate, that this apostate view that provokes the living God. And he brings judgment and righteousness upon them. But on this Sunday, this eve of Thanksgiving, in a sense, I hope this provokes you to worship. And my goal is to study this text and propel us into this week of full joy and thanksgiving. It doesn't mean our problems are all going to go away, right? There's still issues we have, right? We're fallen. We live on this earth. We're sinners uh, saved by God's grace. But, but I pray that this passage will encourage your heart and you will look and see again the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll see that he's worthy and your heart will declare or desire to declare that he is great and you want to worship him in thanksgiving. Well, let me give you a few thoughts this morning. Number one, thanksgiving is found in the presence of our God and Savior. Thanksgiving is found in the presence of our God and Savior. Look at the first two verses of Psalms 95. Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Well, notice here there's an invitation for all God's people to come and worship him. It's a strong plea. Notice it does not neglect few. (laughs) It says all. If you are a a child of God, this passage is calling you, proclaiming to you, drawing you, the entire congregation, to sing for joy to God. It's around the temple, of course, in this time. If, in fact, this is David writing this, the temple was extremely special to him. In fact, he, he was broken over the fact that he had a house to live in, but The Lord still resided in a tent that was brought from the wilderness. You know he charged his son and built every, got everything ready for his son to build Solomon's great temple. But that didn't matter because what David saw, what these writers of the scriptures, these men who loved God, they were enamored with the temple. They were enamored with where God resided. And they wanted people to sing for joy. There's a clear celebration of exuberance from this congregation. He's calling them to be exuberant. The congregation is collectively shouting, shouting to the Lord. This was the way they expressed their love of him, their trust in him. Notice it says he's the rock of our salvation. Oh, well, that's a term that particularly the Jews in the Old Testament understood, didn't they? They would died without that, what, rock in the wilderness. That rock, that 
Moses struck on the command of God gave them life giving water. It was a water that sustained them in a very dry land. And so this term rock gets associated with God all the way through the scriptures. And you know it doesn't stay there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 says, Paul says, that rock was Christ. That's what the Bible says. And so when he says in this great psalm, shout to the Lord joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Everything, we die without him. Do you get that? You die in your sin. You die in your worldly lust and thirst and you perish without him. So shout to him. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our emotions. He's worthy of our emphasis on his greatness. That's what the Bible's telling us here. The shouts are God's people. They're providing this, this, this great worship even in desperate times. Many forms of worship, I think, express. Today we see all kinds of forms. Some are true and some probably are, are not. But this is talking about a natural and a proper expression of joy and enthusiasm. A bursting forth of thanksgiving. Have you ever been that happy about God? You gotta ask yourself, come on, stay with me here. Are you that happy about God? Have you ever just burst out and told him in private, in your closet, publicly, wherever it is, how great he is? See, that's what the psalmist is doing. There's a moment, it, and if this is David, he's at a point where he says, come everybody, I want you to experience the, the excitement and joy of God. That all gets robbed, doesn't it, by the world sometimes. What's robbing you of your joy? What's robbing of you coming and saying, my God is the living God, and I will proclaim him. What's robbing you from that? See, I think there's a hunger for God. Thursday morning, a bunch of us crazies are going to come out here, walk, crawl, some of us. Some will run. And we're going to give $25 to missions. I've already met people who said, I'm not coming, but here's my $25. That's good too. I'm losing my train of thought. But then you're going to come home, and that turkey's going to be in the oven. And those Pies are going to be on the grill and cooling. And that house is going to smell incredible. Getting hungry yet? What I see in this is a worshiper hungry for God. A good friend of mine, pastor friend of mine was with the Lord. When we got together to eat, a bunch of us pastors, he goes, who's ever hungriest, Pray. Do you like that? How many are going to use that today when you go to lunch? Are you hungry for God? See, see, that's the idea. Here the psalmist is starving for God. He's thirsting for him. And when he knows that only he can satisfy him, there produces great praise. And he doesn't want to be alone in this. Notice he says, come, let us, plural, sing for joy to the Lord. Second line, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. This is not just some isolated event in our closet, which is wonderful, but it is a collection of saints who are identified as God's children saying, let us do this. Are you in? Or do you want to sit back and say, well, you know, I really don't want to be known I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to be identified with those people. Oh, brothers and sisters, you're not going to hide for that much longer in this world. You are either a clear worshiper of God, or you might point out those who are. That's happened down through the church age. See, David wants no part of that. He wants us to come and worship him. There is this bursting out of hunger for him. Notice he expresses in many ways here. There's singing, uh, and what would come with music would come with that. We've experienced that this morning. There's shouting, there's words being said here. 
And, and the psalmist in Psalms 100 says in verse 4, enter his gates. There was a gate you came in. And, and they came in to praise God together in the temple. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Boy, I mean, just stop right there. How many of us, and man, it was a busy morning around here. Uh, we were missing, uh, you know, some staff and different things going on. I mean, we're, we're busy around here getting ready because there's all these people coming. And, 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 and did you walk in, Scott, with a thankful heart today? I mean, good question. What was your conversation in the car on the way like? Did you enter into the presence of God with his people, knowing he resides within you? Don't, I, I understand that. But enter into the presence with the congregation in thankfulness. Imagine if all of us, hundreds and hundreds of us, show up here every Sunday and we walked in these doors with thankful hearts, what God would do with that. How that would affect people who don't have thankful hearts. They may, you know, I don't like their doctrine, but those people are sure thankful. I'll take that. I'll take that all day long. Because that would come out in our praise. Look at verse 2 with me. I'm going to move here. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. It's just not sh shouting to God, but it, this is corporate praise done through humility, right? It, it's our humble understanding of who I am and who he is that produces this type of thanksgiving. And we, in a very real sense, express God's truth back to him in a melodious congregational truth. I like that. That's why I like singing. I, I love our worship teams. I, I'm, I'm so grateful for them because it's us together singing the truths of God congregationally in a melodious way. That's what we do. God wants that. If you're not one who sings and you're a mumbler, stop it. Sing. If somebody doesn't like your voice in front of them, they'll find another seat next week. <laughs> Get up front here with me. I can preach, but I can't sing well. But I make that joyful noise. No mumblers here. We have a great God. He deserves it. He, he deserves our expression back to him, this melodious congregation coming together. Looks, and we must... Hear God's word to know God. See, I, I think we sing well because we know him well. See, that's a big difference. And you see people come back and they go, hey, pastor, we went over here and we visited. We were overseas or we were over this or we went to this state or we went, we went to a church. And man, you know, they were really nice people, but we sure missed this place. I think one of the things you miss is because this place, for many, many, many years, has proclaimed the greatness of God, proclaimed the greatness of his son, and that makes us sing. Knowledge of who he is causes you to react to his greatness. That makes a thankful person. If you're not a thankful person, and, and look, this is just you, I'm not, no hand's going to be raised here. We're not that Baptist. If you're not a thankful person, ask God to make you one. And here's how you can do it. You say, God, you have to show me, you have to show me your glory. When Moses got stuck in the cleft of the rock by God and put him there so he could see him, Moses was not very thankful for that nation at that moment. In fact, he's like, nobody can lead these people. He got done seeing the glory of God and he took on that nation. You got a tough situation in your life? Financially, medically, relational? I'll tell you what, a person who is thankful will change all kinds of issues. And it has to be built on Jesus or it just runs out on Monday. Great sermon on Sunday. Didn't go anywhere with Monday with you. Are you thankful? Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Come before your Lord with great gratitude. See, that's the result of hearing the word, being taught the word. You now shout back truth to him. And thankfulness is mixed with joy and truth, and people start shouting. <laughs> they start getting excited. It's not some religious, stoic, emotionalist 
response or some out of control, non-spirit led reaction to music and smoke and whatever else they do. It's a reaction to the glory of the person of our God and Savior and his word being truth. Second thought, the reason and source for true thanksgiving. Look at three through five with me. These are powerful verses. For the Lord is a great God and the great king above all gods in whose hands are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his for it was he who made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Well, now you can see the psalmist giving us compelling reasons and the source of our thanksgiving. Worship belongs to God only. And yet we cannot worship him until we have a proper sense of who he is. Look at the first part of verse 3 there. There he's giving us, the psalmist has given us clarity of God's greatness. The Lord is a great God. And the fact that he alone is great. Notice, the Lord. Not the Lord, small L. Not all the Canaanite gods and the Philistine gods and the gods of the world. This Lord is great. And greatly to be praised, they say, in other places. Notice the latter part of verse 3. Here in, in the fact that there is no comparison to his greatness. Look at this. A great king above all gods. There's no comparison to him. The pagans worshipped sightless, mute, dumb, mythological, false gods who could in no way be compared to the living God of Israel at that time. There was no way to compare. Psalms 15 says they have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, and they cannot hear. They're, they're dead. And you have a living God, and you're alive because of him. You know, well, Scott, that's Old Testament. What about today? Well, today we just worship people. You see how many people show up to, um, what's her name, Swift, uh, Taylor Swift? You see how many people show up to that? It's, it's insane. The cult following a woman like that has. It doesn't stop there. It goes on to athletes and performers of all kinds. People will spend their money they need for food to, to go and see them. And yet they will all die. Do you know right now, I looked this up yesterday to find out what the average is right now in 2023 in November, that 166,324 people will die today around the world. And every day, you'll find a sports character or some movie star or someone will die today. People that made boatloads of money and had following, you know, that we can only imagine. They'll die today. That means that there's 6,930 deaths per hour. There's 116 deaths per minute. And that means a person dies every 1.93 seconds. And the world follows these people. They shout to these people. In fact, when these people say to do something, buy something, or go somewhere, they do it. They're gods to them. And yet, the Bible says, for the Lord is a great God, the great king above all gods. See, we, we are Christians, we're followers of Christ. We're, we are the children of the living God. We still believe the commandments not to bend the knee to any other gods. And yet, we battle with those things. Four and five are precious verses. In whose hands are the depths of the earth? The peaks of the mountains are his also. The seas are his, for it was he who made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Well, unlike the dead gods of the pagans, this living God holds creation in his hands. He's a creator God. But he's, listen, he's not only a creator God, and this, is, this, is, this has got to grip you, he's a sustaining God. He has your life. He's worthy of shouting his praises every once in a while, don't you think? 
Notice, from the sea to the dry land. Well, that's pretty much everything on this big ball, isn't it? From the sea to the dry land, all belong to him. They do as he commands them. He's their creator. And what, what an amazing thing. The oceans stay where they are. Your biblical world view tells you, do not buy what the world's selling about this globe. You have a God who holds it in his hands. And he alone will destroy it. Be a worshiper of him, not a worshiper of his creation. You got to make the connection to Jesus, don't you? He's in the boat. Things are going crazy. They go, aren't you, don't you care about us? He's asleep. The God man's asleep. Don't you care about us? Quiet. I mean, can you, I want to see that scene again, man. The reaction from the disciples is stunning fear of who's in the boat with them. Even the waves obey his voice. Is he not worthy of shouting to every once in a while? Isn't he worthy of your unadulterated attention from time to time (laughs) during the day, during the week? He commands it because of who he is. He draws worship out of his disciples when he says, this is mine, I'll tell it what to do. Do you look at creation that way? I hope some of you get out there every once in a while. We were a ranching, camping family, and it was just part of the normal conversation to admire God whether it was a brand new calf being born or mountain caps with snow on them or whatever it was, it was just our our habit to admire God with our children. Don't miss his display that's right out those doors. And if that's not enough from you, look at the person next to you that's an image bearer of God. He's sustaining it all. See, this drives our thanksgiving. This makes our prayers different. Third, submission to our Lord maker produces thanksgiving. Look at verses six through the middle of seven. Come, let us bow down. Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel, bend the knee before the Lord our maker. For he is our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hands. This morning, Rick and I just got a few minutes, Pastor Rick and I, just before everything was happening. He said, Scott, I love that passage, verse 6. He said, how many years is it, Rick, you've been, you and Claudia have been married? 41. 41 years ago on their bulletin. Remember, we used to have those when we got married a long time ago. On the bulletin when you got married, this was their verse. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Boy, I appreciate that, Rick and Claudia. You kept, you've been doing that for 41 years. And you're a great example of that. And that's, that's what this is about. So here we see now there's the submission, right? He brings us into the understanding of God's relationship with his people. So he not only made the whole earth and the mountain peaks and the seas and the dry land, but he made us. And now there's this appropriate way to approach the creator and king. And he's telling us how to do it. Bow down. Bend the knee. Look, you can tell when somebody gets saved. They bow everything in them to God. Now, they're not perfect, and they got their struggles just like you and I, but you can see them give up on themselves. They'll, they'll just say, God, I'm, I'm empty-handed. And they'll, they'll change. They'll get rid of things in their life. They'll, they'll turn away from all that because now they're bending their life to the greatness of God. That he would save them. Shaha is the Hebrew word there. It means to bow low, to prostrate prostrate oneself before them. Bowing down is a reflection of the attitude of the heart that surrenders to a king. Get lower so you can see him in all of his glory. When Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration, you know what they did. When he is transfigured in front of them, they fell on their faces. They had the best view of him. 
And so here we're told this word is helping us bow down, describes total self-humiliation in the presence of this great God as you adore him for his greatness. And the lower you go, the more thankful you are. Do you want to have a great week? Start low. The Valley of Vision, the great prayers and psalms and sermons that are in that teach us the lower you go, the more glorious God is. That's how you get thankful again. Some may be too high in here. You're too lofty in your own thinking. You want your way. You're not willing to die to it. You, that, that's, you start discovering that. You go, why am I not thankful? Because I, I'm so caught up in me. I'm caught up in what's going on in my life. I'm not low and, and, and laying before my God. Get alone with him this week. Maybe get on the ground with your Bible and look at him that way. Verse 7 tells us there's this personal, intimate relationship with him. He is our God. He's my God is the idea. Notice the plural pronouns. We see him as a great shepherd. We are his humble sheep. We look to him for guidance and protection and care. Listen to David as he writes Psalms 23 in that kind of view. Psalms 23, 1 through 4. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me to the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. Notice the pronouns there. See, that's going down. You're the great shepherd. I don't get to the green pastures without you. I owe all to you. You're mine. This is great God and mighty and enthroned with power. And yet, notice there's this tender care, right? He cares for this defenseless and sometimes, don't take this personally, maybe you should, rather stupid sheep. He cares for us. You arrogant fool. Why do you wonder? My soul is prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love. Rock of Ages. Robert Robinson wrote that. After he had drifted away from God. We're prone to wander, and yet here is this shepherd of our soul who's keeping track of us. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd, lays down my life for the sheep. John 10, 11, verse 14. I'm the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me. There's a clear connection between the shepherd and the flock. And even as the Father knows me, I know the Father, and I lay down my life for you, the sheep. Isn't that beautiful? It's connection. Jesus isn't on earth yet, but there's a connection, this shared character and nature of God and the Son, they shepherd our souls. Goes on to say, my sheep, verse 27, hear my voice and I know them. You want to be thankful? Listen to his voice. He's speaking clearly. Listen to it. He's here talking to you caring for you, feeding you, quenching your thirst. He's here giving you everything that you and I need. For his, greatest, his greatness provokes repentance that leads to thanksgiving. Look at the end of verse 7. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as at Meribah, as in the days of Ma Massa, in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me and they tried me, though they had seen my work. If we're listening to the word, there is immediate response of faith-driven repentance. See, when we listen to the word, it brings us into repentance. A lot of times we can't worship, we're not thankful because we haven't repented. And, and notice there's this warning here of lack of repentance brings this hard-heartedness, but if you trail that back, it comes down to this Hebrew word, shama, meaning to hear. 
your heart is hard, you have no gratitude, you do not come and worship me because you do not hear me. That's the problem. We don't hear him. This word shema means to give a listening ear with strict attentiveness to it. Lord, this morning, you have my attention as you speak to me through your word. I mean, that's how we should come to the Bible each and every time we read it. You have my attention, Lord. Clear my thoughts. Work will be there when I'm done. I'm listening. See, do you believe in the power of the word of God at that level? Speak to me. Jesus knew they weren't listening. Matthew chapter 15, verse 8 and 9, he says, this people honors me with their lips. Mm. This is the American churches as well. But their heart is far from me, but in vain do they worship me. So they're doing some kind of acts, teaching as doctrine the precepts of men. It's man-centered. So worship begins with listening. Worship requires listening to God when he speaks. You need to hear the word, be under the word, be taught the word, be preached to through the word, to read it yourself. That's where Thanksgiving's going to come from. Hearing must lead to obedience, though. Joyful response to God. See, obedience always broke, breaks down, not only in the Old Testament in this passage, but today, because we won't listen and obey. Oh, he says over and over, do not be just hearers only. A lot of good sermon listeners out there. A lot of good people fill churches by the thousands. Monday, they worship something else. Do you hear him? Do you listen to him? Do you obey him? Notice verse 8, he says, do not harden your hearts. His reference is back to these grumbling, complaining Israelites. He reminds them that here's an opposite example. When you grumble and complain, your heart hardens. It becomes rebellious. You reject God, and you reject God through his leaders even. We know they rejected Moses because they're too scared to reject God. They rejected Moses, and thus they rejected God because he was their spokesman. This is all the opposite of thanksgiving. Notice in verse 9 that the psalmist is, a, is doing an examination of comparison of their forefathers. They did not believe. Do you? Do you believe? In reality, the psalmist is charging this later group, will you come by faith and believe in me? Or are you going to hang on to your own views? When God asks us to live by faith, we often try and test him because we would rather live by sight. Let's be honest. It's hard to live by faith. And it's really hard if you try to do it on your own. But he says live by faith, not by sight. That's a hard step for Americans. Many of our friends and dear family members around the world in the church, they have no other way. They live day to day. It's hand to mouth. You're in a third world country. It's very difficult. They, they live by that faith. And when you get around them, it's a, it's, there's such a freshness to it. We have to battle this, brothers and sisters, because what comes with it is our joy and our thanksgiving. Instead of worshiping him, these forefathers, even though God provided for them, they were not patient with him. They didn't like his plan. They didn't like what he was doing next. It didn't fit what they were doing. And they did not find grace in the time of need. And so their lack of repentance robbed them of their thankfulness. But brothers and sisters, I want you to remind yourselves of this. The Lord disciplines the ones he loves. I like, let me say this carefully, after the discipline, I'm thankful for it. Is the Lord on you about something right now? Is your heart hardened towards him, towards one of his children, towards his people in some way? He'll put his hand on you. He'll do it in a loving way, but he'll discipline you because he loves you. He does not want you to die in the wilderness. He wants you to turn to him. 
last thought, desire, eternal thanksgiving and rest and do not go astray in your heart. Verses 10 and 11 are quite stark reality of what happens when you're not a worshiper. For 40 years, I loathe that generation. Can you imagine God saying that about you? I loathe you. I mean, it scares me. <laughs> I loathe you. God, creator, sustainer, giver of life, says I loathe a certain group of people. You know who those are? People who come to him any other way than by faith in his son. It just is. You reject me, I loathe you. It's, it's, you can't get around this. I know people want to sugarcoat this and try to make God look a little better to the world because we don't want him to hear that kind of God. No, no, he loathes people who will not put their faith in his son. That's, that's what it is. Now, praise God, we don't know who's going to come to faith. And so we keep teaching our great God to people and keep handing out the gospel and we keep doing all those things. But in the end, all those who will be separated from God will be loathed by him. And they'll be just like these people in the wilderness. And notice how it happened. They said they are a people who err in their heart. The idea is they go astray in their heart. That means they can do outward things right. I can show up, I can do this, do that, say that, do these things. But in my heart, I have nothing to do with God. And they do not know my ways. What a great question. Do you know the ways of God? Do you know the way of salvation? Do you know the way of his holiness? Do you know where he is right now? Do you know how he watches over his people? Do you know him? What a great question. And so you either get God's anger or you get his ways. One of the two. Do you want to fall under his righteous anger of a holy God? Or do you want to enter into his rest by faith in his son? That's, that's the difference. Rest is a beautiful word. It means to be at peace. Hebrews 4 highlights this. The writer of Hebrews 4 says, They rejected God and they did not enter into his rest. If there's anything, brothers and sisters, that you can be thankful for this morning is you entered into his rest when he saved you. You are no longer at war with God if you're a true believer in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You've entered his rest. So this week, we're going to leave from here. I don't know what your plans are, but we have a house full coming and we're excited about it. We're going to get out here and run some laps and give some money to missions and laugh and giggle and pull a few hamstrings. <laughs> but we're going to do it with joy. And if you're like our family, we're going to stand around a table with family and friends and we're going to be full of gratitude. Now you may be in a position where there's some people that aren't like that. But please please ask God to give you an opportunity to say how thankful you are of your God and Savior. Don't miss it. You may not see that person again. You have no idea what God's doing. Do not miss the opportunity to tell of the greatness of God. Amen? Father, thank you for this time together in the Word. We thank you for Psalms 95. We can just almost see if it's King David calling God's people, come, come let us shout to the Lord. Let his greatness, his, his aspects of creation, let his, his sustain, he can sustain all things, let that drive our worship. Let's not be like our forefathers who rejected God in the wilderness. Let's be those who love and are full of gratitude of what God has done. And then we can shout, Lord, of your greatness. Unashamed worship of our great God and Savior. Lord, now we're going to turn to your table. We can't think of anything more that could stimulate our, our love for your great plan of salvation. And so, Lord, as we take this this table of remembrance of your son's work, may this propel us into this week 
that each and every day, everything we do throughout this week, we would have grateful hearts, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I was so glad to see that Pastor Rick and Hayward had put the Lord's table on this Sunday before Thanksgiving. I can't think of a a greater way to go into this week than to remember our Lord's death. But as we start, I want to prepare your hearts as we get ready to receive this. Colossians chapter 4 verse 2 says, devote yourself to prayer. I, I think that's a true mark of a Christian. Prayer is a a mark of trust. It's a mark of submission to God. And so when we pray, we should be submitting to Him. So He says, devote yourself to prayer. And then He says this, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. I began to think about this verse this week and I thought, what keeps us from being alert to an attitude of thanksgiving? Well, lack of repentance. So before the men come, I want to give you three prayers. I'm going to walk you through this. And each time I'm going to give you the next prayer to pray through. And then we're going to get this in our hands and we're going to sing. But the first one is repentance. And so right now this morning I want you to bow your head with me and myself included. Are there areas that you need to repent in? I would imagine every one of us have some area that we need to repent to the Lord. Some area that's robbing you of being thankful. Is it a relationship issue? Is it a lack of trust in God and your health, your finances? What is it? Only you know. So please take the next moment here and ask God to reveal it and repent of it. next prayer is a prayer of God's greatness. Spend a moment and tell God three or four things that make Him great as you understand Him in the Scriptures. Tell Him right now three or four things that make Him great according to the Scriptures to you. Finally, I want you to pray prayers of thanksgiving. You should come up with many, many things here, and I'm going to have to stop you as you pray. But tell the Lord why your heart is thankful at this moment. Father in heaven, we thank you that you sent your son to die for our past, present, and future sins. We seem to forget that sometimes. We let our sin distract us. And maybe we even let other people's sin bother us. So Lord, we repent here this morning of not repenting of our sins. We dismiss them. We blame shift them. And we lose our thanksgiving. We lose our joy. And so, Lord, we thank you that Jesus died on the cross, was nailed there. His blood was spilt. He was the final lamb for our past, present, and future sins, Lord, and that they are gone. Help us live as free people. 
Help us be quick to repent. And Lord, that leads us into your greatness. What kind of God are you who can plan our eternality, our existence, and yet know we would reject you and yet provide a way to forgive us? You are great. Not only that, Lord, you put us on a beautiful planet. And every time we open our eyes, we see your handiwork. From day into day and night into night, declares your glory. You are a great God. Help us not to fear those who do not know you. Help us to have a great God worldview that comes from the Bible. Help us love your greatness. Lord, we thank you that that causes us to be thankful people. When we repent and when we think of your greatness, the response is thanksgiving, Lord. Our hearts now are free to worship you and enjoy the bounty of blessing, Lord. And on all tables, probably represented in this room, will be plenty of food and people that love one another. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be a thankful church, thankful for the little things and the great things. And now, Lord, as we remember your son's finished work on the cross, may this dominate our thinking when it comes to thankfulness. May this be first and foremost that Lord Jesus Christ, before his death, broke bread and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body. Take it. Eat it. Consume me. And you'll be satisfied in me. This is my blood spilt for you to forgive you of all of your sins, past, present, and future, to bring you into the very presence of my Father, clean, pure, and perfect. Lord, this is worthy of praise and thanksgiving. I pray that each one of us would be full of thanksgiving this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So 
before his death he took bread and when he had taken some of the bread he said he gave thanks <laughs> and his description of his thankfulness was this that he broke it and he gave it to him and here it is this is my body now listen listen to this which is given for you it's given for you <laughs> Oh, we're going to break some bread this week. Well, that can't save you. The bread of life saves you. And so he broke that bread in an illustration. And then he said, do this in remembrance of me. And so if you can take that little cup there with the bread in it, let's pray and let's take this in remembrance of Jesus, the bread of life, who can satisfy you and sustain you for eternity. Partake in him. Jesus, we thank you for your death on the cross. We thank you for your bodily death. It was not some spirit-filled person or something. It was you, the Savior, the King of glory. And it is through you, Lord, us being satisfied in the finished work of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have salvation. And so we take this bread in remembrance of the bread of life who gave us life for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Take the bread. The next verse is beautiful. It says, in the same way he took the cup, and after they had taken it, saying, this cup, which is poured out, here's that little phrase again, for you, is a new covenant in my blood. The old had to be completed. That was what he did. Final lamb, no more blood, no more lambs. Amen. Old covenant, done. New covenant, starting. And that's where we are. And his blood brought us into that. And so he is the central figure of all the way through the scriptures. All completed in him. Do you believe that? This will make you thankful if you believe it. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you shed your blood for us. The blood of lambs held off the wrath of your father, but they were not the answer. So you came and you fulfilled the old covenant. We do not live by that for salvation. You brought the new covenant, which is done through and in your blood. And we have new life because life is in the blood. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying and spilling your blood for us. Father, thank you for receiving your son's blood, that perfect sacrifice, and removing our sins. Lord, may we be thankful this week for our salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take this. If you're visiting with us today, we have greeters back to my left back here. They want to greet you give you a gift, tell you them how much they love you and glad you're here. We want to thank you for coming. Remember, come run the race and with us on, on well, the, it's not a race. <laughs> there are a few that think it is. Josh's class. Uh, we won't go there. Come out. 
crawl, walk, hand out water, sign people up. Lots of things you can do. You don't have to raise this. Come. We want your money um, <laughs> for missions. And then remember to buy your tickets. Go get the tickets. C- bring someone who doesn't know Jesus to that Christmas banquet. They're going to hear the gospel, I promise. You are dismissed.